and we have to really escalate the noise we make so that we'll be heard. Say I'm Andy Hum. I'm Ann Northrup. And uh, we have a, a special guest today. He is gay journalist Michael Meenan. You may have read about him in the New York Times. He has come forward about sexual abuse he suffered at Fordham Prep High School in the Bronx in 1984. Come forward with good results. Uh, Donald Trump is set to join Marco Rubio at a gathering of the anti-LGBT religious right in Orlando this week. Uh, the Supreme Court has uh, put a ruling for a transgender boy in Virginia on hold. And the trial of the anti-LGBT Chief Justice of Alabama is set for September. Lambda is fighting uh, the abuse of a lesbian resident of senior housing in Illinois. We'll give you the LGBT angles on the Olympics, plus a WNBA star has come out, and a major league soccer team challenges homophobia from fans. In Istanbul, a gay Syrian refugee was murdered after surviving a previous rape and beating. Indonesia is moving to criminalize gay sex, but Belize has just, just overturned its ban. And the Ugandan police raided an LGBT pride event, arrested the activists, and then canceled more public uh, pride events uh, after violence was threatened. And stay tuned, Andy will review Cats. <laughs> <laughs> but we start with a very serious subject. We Thank do. you for being here, Michael Meenan. Andy, uh, thanks for having me. We know you as a colleague at the Gay City News, right. a reporter for New York One, you wrote for the New York Times blog, uh, and uh, you, you're, you are a writer. Uh, but you have come forward uh, after 32 years? No, we got to clear that up. Yes. Um, I was sexually assaulted in June of 84, 1984 in a classmate's home, a classmate from Fordham Prep. We had just graduated. That November, as a freshman at Brown... By a teacher, let's put it By that. my religion teacher, yep. senior year. That November, uh, in my homecoming back to Fordham Prep, we have an annual tradition where you go back your first year and you, you visit right. with the uh, faculty and whatnot. That November of 84, I stepped up to the headmaster who had been the headmaster my four years at Fordham Prep. And I said to him, we need to speak privately. And we went into his office. He knew me very well. Um, I had been student government president and uh, was very active in school life. And I explained to him what had happened, that I had fallen asleep. And this religion teacher, who was also present at this party, as inappropriate as that was during a night of drinking and cavorting with uh, teenage boys, uh, began performing oral sex on me while I was asleep and then began trying to prevent me from extricating myself from him when I woke up. Um, I told the headmaster about this and one of the first remarks out of his mouth was, so Meenan, are you telling me that you think you're a faggot? Now, we all know what that word means. We all know how that word can be used with a 17, 18 year old boy to shut down conversation and to send a very hostile direct message to him about what is going to happen if you continue with these allegations. And yet he said apparently or you, uh, that, that uh, we will take care of it. Yes. And what happened? Mo nothing. And so what The teacher was still there now. He's been there for 32 years since. And this is what has happened. 84, I give the headmaster a heads up that a very serious crime has been committed. He did nothing. And he was legally obligated at that time as a reporter to hand this off to law enforcement. Um, and this is not the 1950s. This is 1984. Well, it's the 1940s and perhaps at Fordham Prep. Right. Because that's what this is beginning to sound like. Yes. And that's what really saddens me. Okay. It saddens me greatly that a school 
uh, where I got a great education and where, quite frankly, some really outstanding uh, gay men, including Jesuit priests, gave me a wonderful education. Gay men who were very appropriate, who were generous, um, and who were very proud of standing up for social justice. Um, that with, with, within the context of that, there is this great evil. Um, and this is not very different from a lot of other schools, okay? I gotta say that right now. This is not a Ford and Prep problem, it's a societal problem. Happened at my high school, Chaminade, and it just came out recently. And you guys were uh, educators, I was an educator, I was a dean of students at two New York City public high schools. It also happened there. It tended to be heteronormative um, and, and not male on male. Regardless, um, these things happen across the board. This is what's happening here, okay? It's becoming very apparent that the New York Times story is raising very serious questions. It's the old dictum. What did they know and when did they know it? Mm -hmm. The guy had been at Fordham Prep for 15 years when he taught me. In the New York Times article, a gentleman from the 70s stepped forth and said, uh, this guy demanded I take off my clothes at a swimming hole. Mm -hmm and became irritated when I didn't. And was plying students with liquor. Uh, Outrageous. Uh, endlessly, everywhere, all the time. Outrageous. I mean, I'm sober 24 years, okay? Mm -hmm. And I think in some, in some respects, that is what has preserved my life. Mm -hmm. Because if a guy is out there at my age still drinking and drugging, I'm gonna tell you, he's in really bad shape. As a, as a sex abuse uh, victim because he's not going to have the wherewithal to fight back. Um, the teacher, Fernand Beck, belongs in prison. He should have done jail time a long time ago. I spared him that, quite frankly. Um, I could have really uh, pursued this more aggressively. I handed it off to a headmaster who I thought was going to uh, do the right thing. He didn't. The guy lingered there for another 32 years. And how do you have a guy in a position of teaching religion who you know probably has an inappropriate attraction for boys at the least, and at the worst has the capacity to commit sex crimes? How does he stay in a school for nearly half a century? It's truly unimaginable. Just uh, so the audience gets the whole picture here, finish the story of what happened and how you finally did bring him to some kind of justice. My best buddy, Neil Huff from Fordham Prep, uh, and, and I want to I thank my classmates from Fordham Prep who have stepped up to the plate. Some read the article and reached out to me. Some were helpful in getting me to deal with the legal action that this has required. I'm deeply grateful to them. Um, they all happen to be straight guys as well, and they're fantastic human beings. They're my brothers, and I love them deeply, and we have a lifelong bond. Um, and Neil Huff. Neil Huff, for 30 years, has been saying to me, hey, Mike, what about doing something? And I would say to him, hey, Neil, look, uh, really not your problem. Like, uh, and I already spoke to McCarthy about this, and so screw the place. I mean, every alumni envelope I ever got from them, I threw in the garbage. Um, Neil comes back and he says, I was in Spotlight, and we're doing... The movie. The that movie. won the Academy Award about the sex abuse in, Bo in Boston, Massachusetts. Neil's yeah. been in a ton of stuff. He's a professional actor, stage, screen, film. I can't keep track of all the stuff he's been in. And I didn't know what Spotlight was, and I said, Neil, thanks, but no thanks. He said, Mike... It's a movie about the Boston Globe and the sex abuse scandal up there. I said, look, I read all about it, okay? He said, would you be willing to talk to one guy? I said, who is it? And it was the guy in the New York Times article who told me that Beck had also abused him after a night of heavy drinking. Um, he and I spoke. I got back to Neil, and I said, I'm in action. I said, we're going to do this. I said, if we do this, Neil, we do it to the finish. I'm a Bronx boy. A lot of these guys come from Westchester. And I need to explain to them. A street fight does not just involve sticks. <laughs> it involves other weapons. This is a street fight. We got to push this to the finish. This is a dark, dangerous place. The article mentioned me living without electricity and food at times. 
at times included months and months without electricity. I just came out of housing court again last week. I'm an Ivy League graduate, and thank God our country has food stamps, because it's kept me alive the past year. And I'm not, I'm not ashamed to say that, okay? Um, because I'm very lucky to be alive because of this incident. Um, and Neil has stuck with me right from the get-go. He's been there, been willing to stick out his neck, uh, put himself on the line. Uh, I'm very grateful to him. Mitchell Garabedian, the guy portrayed by Stanley Tucci in the movie, is my attorney. And Mitchell and I are working right now hand in hand to see this thing through to the end. Um, he's been contacted by other victims. He's been contacted by other people from Fordham Prep who are divulging details to him about other sex crimes. And this is a very serious matter. So Mitchell went to the school uh, on your behalf to blow the whistle on this guy because right. he was still there. Right. And they have now uh, forced him out, ousted him, gotten him to... At first, the Jesuits came back and um, they basically told uh, my attorney, uh, Mitchell Garabedian, to go fly a kite. Really? Um, uh, and this guy is not a Jesuit. Ferdinand Beck is a layman. He's not a Jesuit. It is a Jesuit school, however. So I can understand that jurisdictional um, sort of, you know, tiptoeing around. Um, there was then another sort of approach to the matter, and the response was, okay, we got to look into this, because there is a very clear boilerplate outlined by the Archdiocese of New York as to what must happen when an allegation winds up in your inbox, okay? It's very clear. Um, and it doesn't matter if it happened yesterday or if it happened 30 years ago. Um, and Ford and Prep, to its credit, under the leadership of uh, a, young, a young Jesuit by the name of Christopher Deverin, who, by the way, apologized to me. He put out his hand and he apologized to me for what had happened to me, which I thought was gracious. I thought it was generous. I accepted his apology. And I think he's a good man. And I think he's trying to do the right thing. Um, I think he understands the severity of this sex crime. Well, they, they hired people to do their own investigation, and that's why they suspended him. It's including a gentleman uh, from the firm of Day and Pitney, a gentleman by the name of Stan Twardy, who is a former U.S. attorney from Connecticut. Now, For, former yeah, federal prosecutor. We should say, because we are running out of time, that, that, that people who have experienced a, a, abuse at Fordham Prep, there is a hotline that they can call. Maybe we should give them the number? Give them the number. Uh, it's the school's number. If you, it's 718-584-8594 it, if, if you have experienced abuse, because more people are coming forward now. If they, don't, if they feel that they don't feel comfortable calling the school, and I can understand that, because this brings out a lot of rage. I mean, you can see the rage coming out of me just sitting sure. here, and I'm dealing with this effectively. Um, they should call, just Google Mitchell Garabedian. Google my attorney, and I'm not trying to fish around for work for him. Uh, that's, uh, he's a good guy, and he's doing uh, social justice work. Right. And we need to know what is what did they know, and when did they know it. And clearly, your message is it's never too late. And in particular, because this has had a lifelong effect on you. This is not something that was just a momentary thing for you. And I'm single. I just turned 50. Uh, I could be single for a variety of reasons. I told you that, you know, I'd gotten sober at the age of uh, 26. Um, uh, this miscreant was pouring booze down the throat of a kid with a biochemical disposition for alcohol dependency without a second thought. I mean, I'm talking about to the point of intoxication. The night I was sexually assaulted, I was intoxicated, and he waited until I was intoxicated enough to commit this sex crime. Horrifying. And it took a, uh, a law enforcement official in Westchester County, a woman who's, who has specialized in these crimes for years, to educate me very recently that when you perform oral sex on a child, it's a form of rape. 
Absolutely. And I, you know, like a lot of guys, you know, Andy, I mean, Andy and I grew up in a similar Catholic schoolboy environment. You kind of shrug that stuff off. You know, well, well, he was blowing me. No. He was committing a severe sex crime. And I was able to shove that stuff off. But guess what? The toxin was already in my system. Yes. Well, it was a toxin. And well, you it's affected you all this time. You have We're going to shake this baby off. I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm well. a tough SOB <laughs> who I grew up right across. I grew and up a great right journalist. Up, listen, yes. I grew up right up from, uh, I grew up on 194th Street, right up the block from Fordham University, from Fordham Prep. And I am. And um, you wore, wrote award-winning stories on the Newark uh, case with the, yeah, with the, with the, with the, with that, the girls that out there, little, the young that, women out there. That little, uh, that special, special young girl changed my life. I've never met her. Fifteen-year-old out lesbian, she happened to be African American, uh, killed in a hate crime. Uh, she changed my life. She gave me a springboard to remind me of her name again. Uh, Sakia Gunn. Right. Of course. With two ends. And uh, I had been a dean of students for many years before this. I was in the offices of Gay City News, hanging around, looking for something to do. And a paper came through the fax machine that said, rally tonight in Newark. Mm. Uh, lesbians unite. You know, one of our sisters has been killed. Right. I said, what is this? This is bizarre. But I knew immediately, having been a dean, that this was big. Uh -huh. Well, you've done a lot of good work. You're doing good work now. We're proud of you. Congratulations. Thank you, Andy. Thank, Thank you for you. having me here. Thank, Thank you. you. And uh, keep us informed about how this develops. This story has legs, yeah. and I hope you'll you'll have me back when sure. we have other uh, bigger developments, and they're going to happen. Absolutely. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Michael. Good to Lovely see you. Lovely to see you. I'll see you. Okay. Glad you made it. All right. Take care. Uh, and now on to more horror stories of Donald Trump. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> Yeah, it's a sad but lovely segue. Yes. Uh, we are, uh, uh, once again, as we uh, say frequently around here, we are taping on Wednesday afternoon, and tomorrow morning as we tape on Thursday, Donald Trump is due in Orlando, Florida, to appear before hundreds, again, of religious right-wing leaders. What do you mean? It's called Rediscovering God in America. Yeah, that's exactly what and it's of course called. He's, because he's joining Marco Rubio. This is on the two-month anniversary of the Orlando uh, shooting, and it's in Orlando. It's yeah. outrageous. Of course, Marco Rubio says, ha, huh, leave it to the media and the liberal activists to label a gathering of faith leaders as an anti-LGBT event. It's nothing. Of, it's a celebration of faith. <laughs> well... What I like about it is Hillary that, Clinton was invited. Well, there's she's been not going. Uh, thank I hope. heavens, <laughs> no, she's not going, or this is not supposed to go. But there's been a lot of discussion in, about this in the press about how Trump has been trying to court the evangelicals, and he put Pence on the ticket. He's, and, le he's leading among evangelicals overwhelmingly. Yeah. Well, the not leaders, Mormons, the leaders of this event said. Well, that's not enough. <laughs> We're going to ask him questions. We're going to ask him what he is going to do about homosexual totalitarianism. <laughs> oh, man. I can't wait to see that. Unfortunately, I think it's a closed door meeting, and we are unlikely to see actual footage of this, although maybe the Christian Broadcasting Network will be in there. Uh, at any rate, I, I hope there is a lot of coverage of it and that you see that by the time you see this. But uh, we will certainly follow up next week well, with whatever we learn about if it. If you have any doubts that uh, Trump is anti-gay, read Larry Kramer's uh, letter that he wrote this week uh, to good. Steve Roth, who was a, bi a billionaire who was an advisor to Trump, but is married to uh, Daryl Roth, uh, the producer uh, of, of The Normal Heart, uh, and is the father of Jordan Roth, who is a gay and just got married uh, a couple of years Two ago. Two kids. Right? All that kind of stuff. And yep. Larry is pleading with him and with the American people. If this isn't enough, his record on LGBT issues, enough to stop you from endorsing against all the other stuff that's happening, please. So we'll see what happens with that. I liked Hillary's characterization of this uh, panel of economic advisors as, uh, you know, a few billionaires, a few hedge fund guys, and six guys named Steve. <laughs> 
I counted. I think there are less than six, but there are several. Well, uh, and uh, for another view on Orlando, Ellen Page is coming back with the second season of her Gaycation series, and uh, she went to Orlando to investigate what was going on there after the Pulse massacre, and that'll air. That episode will air on. Uh, August 24th, Wednesday, okay. August 24th, okay. so look for that. And, you know, we should report these things. A Trump spokesperson, Katrina Pearson, was revealed oh, to Oh, she's a monster. Have, have you read about her? To have tweeted in 2012, yeah. gay is not normal, except that. Yeah, I saw her. Spokesperson. I saw her on the air on CNN defending his, uh, you know, shoot uh, Hillary comments. Now, uh, the what's what's emerging, of course, is a lot of people who don't want to vote for either candidate, especially in the Republican Party. And this guy Evan McMullen is now running as an independent. Now, he's a t he's a Mormon, totally right wing. Uh, you know, Very. But he was pressed. Former CIA guy. He was pressed about same-sex marriage, and he said, "Well, of course, I'm personally against it, but it's settled law, and I wouldn't appoint Supreme Court justices to overturn it." Of course, if you appoint, oh, if you appoint conservatives. Uh, right-wingers, I should say, not conservatives, right-wingers to the court, they will overturn it. McMullen is not an answer. No, um, but, these, but it does show you that the party is, some of the people in the party are recognizing we got to move on. Well, Some they haven't liked him from the beginning. The party's been split from the beginning over him. Right. Uh, Trump was in North Carolina again this week, where uh, <laughs> the, uh, the populace is now saying 58% of them hate Governor McCrory for uh, bringing them HB2. Uh, he's in trouble in his reelection campaign. Yes, he is. But he is still supporting HB2. Trump is still supporting him. He is still supporting Trump. Trump is still They're supporting HB2. They're all going HB2. down with the ship. Uh, Tim Kaine, however, went to North Carolina and condemned HB2. Now, Barbara Streisand is headlining an, uh, an event called LGBT for Hillary. Where is this? going to be at Cipriani Wall Street in New York. We're not mm. promoting it, we're just saying it. If you, uh, it, uh, if you want to uh, actually meet with Hillary, you have to donate six figures at the event. Well, the money is going to uh, Senate candidates, House candidates, state parties, national parties, yes. all over the place. Barbara Streisand. Yeah. Uh, in other politically related news, uh, Judge Roy Moore in Alabama has been trying to get out of any kind of uh, uh, condemnation or prosecution for his unwillingness to follow the law. Uh, by telling probate judges in Alabama they didn't have to follow the law of, of legalizing right. same-sex marriage. And he's been, try he's been trying to get it all dismissed and everything. Well, well a federal it's... court uh, dismisses dismissed a suit against the Judicial Inquiry Commission, which filed the ethics complaint against Roy Moore, and won't lift the suspension of Moore while the court of the judiciary is deciding the ethics case. Right, and it's going to be go on trial September 28th. And also in Alabama, a probate judge accused of sending sexually charged messages and nude photos to a woman he met when she went to his office to wed another man has agreed to a six-month unpaid suspension. Uh, this is Judge Leon Archer. Uh, he's one of the judges who uh, quit performing same-sex marriages uh, rather than al allow them to wed in his office. And his staff uh, does continue to issue wedding licenses to uh, um, opposite-sex couples. On the other hand, in Fairfax, Virginia, Mayor Scott Silverthorne has been arrested uh, because he was offering to trade meth for <laughs> group sex with men. <sighs> Uh, he blamed the fact that he'd had cancer, he'd gone bankrupt, he'd lost his home, he'd lost his other job. Uh, nonetheless, he's under arrest for, uh, mostly for his drug crimes. Right. Group sex with men is not a crime in most places, I guess, right. these days. Okay. If it's consensual. Um, in uh, 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 more legal kind of news? Well, I was going to go to uh, the Supreme Court and Gavin Grimm. Well, let's do that then. The Supreme Court uh, was asked... Gavin Grimm is this transgender boy yep. who won his case about his right to use the gender-appropriate bathroom in the school, but the Gloucester County School Gloucester. Board... Is, Gloucester County School Board is fighting 
fighting him. Yes. To he the, was to originally the using the boys' room with no problem. Then the, uh, the school had a complaint or two and barred him. And then he went to court and he won his case at the Fourth Circuit. But the school board and the right wing is still fighting him, and the, the case keeps going up through the uh, they system. They keep losing. And so they, they want to take this to the Supreme Court. And so they asked the Supreme Court not to let Gavin use the boys' room while the Supreme Court is deciding whether to take the case. They haven't made that decision right. yet. And we thought, well, every court has decided in his favor. Surely the Supreme Court is not going to stop him from uh, using the bathroom. But Wrong. Ju but Justice Stephen Breyer, who was supposed to be one of ours, uh, said as a courtesy, uh, he will uh, uh, put a hold on it while they decide whether to take the appeal by the school board. And, of course, they're not going to decide until they come back into session in October. So Gavin is going to go Terrible. back to school uh, in September or maybe even August uh, without the right to use the boys room. Now we we plucked a couple of minutes of Gavin uh, off of YouTube because we talk about him a lot but we haven't shown him talking so we thought you might want to meet Gavin Grimm. Standing at the school board meeting last year was equal parts humiliating and terrifying. Humiliating because at age 15 I had to witness adults of my community discuss in a public forum some rather intimate details of my anatomy. In plainer words, the anatomy of a 15-year-old was considered appropriate for public conversation by the Gloucester County School Board. For any kid, that would be mortifying. However, for a kid who is transgender, bringing to the forefront of people's minds the very part of themselves that already makes them dysphoric is incomparably distressing. I sat by while people re repeatedly called me a, a girl. She, her, young lady, confused young lady, even freak. Bullying is already an enormous problem for high school age youth, and especially transgender youth. To hear adults of my community treat me as if I was a creature for their ridicule and observation or some oddity on a stage was incredibly dehumanizing to an extent I could not possibly convey. And of course, I was terrified, firstly because the school board had the power to bar me from the correct restroom for the rest of my time at Gloucester High School. Secondly, because I was in a room full of adults who thought it appropriate to have this sort of vulgar discussion who would clap or cheer after every derogatory statement, of which there were many. After enduring all of that, twice, I felt as though I couldn't possibly take any more hits, but I did because at the end of the school board meetings, my school board chose to enact a policy that would further alienate and stigmatize me by forcing me to use separate restrooms from all of the other students at the school. For me, the thought of going into a separate restroom, which might as well have been labeled other, was just far too much to bear. The trek to the restroom in the nurse's office each time it was necessary was similarly humiliating, similarly upsetting, and othering and dysphoria inducing. The only difference was that it was just slightly less conspicuous. I am fighting this fight because no kid should have to think so hard about performing a basic and private function of being alive. No kid struggling to be accepted and struggling to accept themselves should have to simultaneously battle for the right to use the correct bathroom. That is why I have come to this point. I hope that I will be one of the last kids that has to go through something like this, and I'm going to do what I can to ensure that. We're with you, Gavin. Thank you, Gavin. Good luck. Very courageous. Uh, well, and then nationally, uh, the Attorney General of Texas is in court this week, Friday, to get a national preliminary injunction against these bathroom law. Uh, and, and really what they're fighting is the president's guidance, uh, not, that's what not, not a law. That's what they're suing to stop, except that the president hasn't done anything, right. so there's nothing to do. And then in Wilmington... And, and in Texas, in Pearland, a four-year-old trans girl is having to fight for bathroom <laughs> access. Four. Four. I thought little kids were allowed to go into either restroom with their parents. Her evangelical mother was against her transitioning at first, but has now been enlightened and is supporting her beautifully. And in Wilmington, Delaware, a transgender inmate is accusing the prison officials there of denying her access to medically recommended hormone therapy, reading her legal mail, and putting her in solitary confinement because... Uh, the, the inmate is complaining. It's, so there's a civil rights suit there. It is not just trans uh, kids or people who are being abused in the system. We have uh, become aware through Lambda Legal Defense of the case of Marsha Marie Wetzel, a senior lesbian who, after her partner died, uh, her partner's family took away her house and all her belongings. Marie ended up in a Marsha ended up in a uh, a senior, senior living. living home and is yeah. being abused there. And Lambda produced a video 
about her, and so we would like to run that video of Marsha's story. Here, the golden years, what I used to think. Me and Judy sitting on the porch, our house, and just relaxing. But that's not realistic, because when you retire and you're gay, there's more fear, more worry, more staying on your toes. My name is Marcia Marie Wetzel, and I live at Glen St. Andrew Living Community in Niles, Illinois. Judy, the love of my life. She was proud of me to be a guard. I always teased her she fell in love with my uniform. She says, maybe at first, but I, I fell in love with what was under it. And that picture she had on her little table for 30 years. She was just so generous of herself so giving, so loving, so pretty. And then we decided to adopt a baby. He came along, our, our life got better. It glued us. She died of colon cancer. It was very, very hard, but I took care of her till the ambulance come to take her to the hospice. I was shunned, completely shut out. No one would drive me to her funeral. I sat on the couch, I couldn't even cry. I thought, such hate for what we were. There was nothing wrong with what we were. He wasn't himself. He started hitting me. The court said for two years, he and I could not contact. I didn't know what to do. I stayed at the house. I get a knock on the door. It's a sheriff's deputy. I'm being evicted. I needed a place to live. The social worker called around and she said, I found a place in Niles. We set up an appointment and I got a room. When I first got here, I started meeting the people. It was great, making all these new friends. And I thought, hey, this, this isn't bad. And then uh, it changed. One of the residents, we were talking about our children. And she's, oh, where's your husband? I said, I never had a husband. Oh, you're a single parent? I said, no, I had a partner. My partner was a woman, and we raised a son. It got out. And I thought, oh, no. Here we go again. They hate. There were a handful of residents. I could tell they were really going to give me trouble. I tried to avoid them, but they would seek me out to taunt me. I've heard every negative homosexual term. I've been hit more than once. You can get so scared, you can't sleep, you can't eat. You don't want to take a shower. You don't want to get dressed. You don't want to go in the hall. When is it going to stop? I'd look out the window. I got a cemetery out there. That's when I'll stop being made fun of because I'm gay. I feel like the staff don't protect me. I don't feel any safety in going to them. They accuse me of things I don't do. They ignore me like I'm a ghost. I put in a complaint, I hear nothing. I'm not treated like the other residents. If you can't go to the staff, who do you go to? I'm disabled. I have financial worries. You have other things to contend with. I thought, there's a lot of places like this. How many other gays in these retirement homes are going through what I'm going through? They're not being properly taken care of or protected. I want to stick with this and get justice. And I want people to know, stop pushing us around. The older I'm getting, and the pride I feel knowing Judy Kahn and loving her and her loving me, it's easier to handle these taunts, but still there are some that surprise you and hurt you. I know she's rooting for me and she'd be happy that I'm doing it for her and she'd be happy I'm doing it for myself. Uh, we really hope 
that Lambda gets justice for Marsha. I also hope it reminds couples that you need to protect each other as much as possible. Uh, I don't think marriage was available to her and her partner when she passed away, but you can write ironclad wills and things to protect each other's property. Don't let this happen to you. Uh, and in New Jersey, four lesbians have sued the state uh, because they state they're not getting insurance coverage because of state rules about infertility treatments. Well, if you want infertility treatments, you have to have two years of unprotected sexual intercourse first. Heterosexual unprotected to prove that uh, you know you're infertile. Well, 15 states uh, do cover fertility treatment, uh, and California and Maryland have updated their language to require it regardless of sexual orientation. I remember the lesbian who worked for Walmart who couldn't get her partner dying of cancer covered by them. Well, Walmart has now given the LGBT Bar Association $30,000 so young lawyers and law students can attend the Lavender Law Conference. This is being called pinkwashing by uh, activists. Uh, <laughs> the woman whose wife was dying spent $175,000 on bills. <laughs> That's one case. You thought we could stop talking about St. Patrick's Day parades? Well, in Boston, where they let the gay group in the last, I guess the last two years, uh, the South Boston Allied War Veterans Council that runs it in Boston said they were coerced by the mayor into doing this, <laughs> and they're suing. They said he threatened to withhold permits if they didn't let the gay group in, and the mayor's people said, well, we didn't withhold the permits, <laughs> did we? <laughs> A <laughs> uh, horrible story out of New York, a thug shouting homophobic slurs stabbed a gay strap hanger, that means a subway rider, traveling with his boyfriend and his sister on the number one train on Saturday. Uh, he, the assailant got angry because he, 28, saw the guy with his partner and started shouting, uh, you know, you faggot, and then stabbed him in the left side of his chest. He's in serious but stable condition. Uh, we found the picture of the Navy ship that's being named for Harvey Milk, uh, the USNS Harvey Milk, uh, a John Lewis class oiler. There it is. Uh, naming ceremony August 16th okay. in San Francisco. And another note from San Francisco, there the city's going to start collecting voluntarily data about the sexual orientation and gender identity of their residents to assess needs. Also in San Francisco, they've saved the Lone Star Saloon. Maybe. This, this is the first gay bar Maybe. that was declared a legacy business under a law approved by the voters. They have this in England yeah. to protect places that are that have been around forever and that are really integral parts of the community. I like things like that. Yeah, the owner can still sell it. Uh, uh, a lot of you were upset with Delta Airlines this week because you can't, maybe you still are, can't fly. Well, they've also took, uh, they, the, version of the movie Carol, the lesbian movie that they were showing, cut all the kissing scenes. Well, now, they what said the, they yeah. were offered two versions, the, the full version and the edited version, and they took the edited version because they, the edited version took out the explicit sex scenes, which were pretty mild, Yes. Uh, and also deleted the kissing scenes, and they didn't have the option to I, to. I think it's because a lot of people equate gay s kissing with, with s uh, sex and can't stand to look at it, and, and it's a shame that the studio did that. Yes, that's the studio's issue, yes. perhaps. All right. All right. Uh, and Gays Against Guns got some good coverage this week for a new action against the BlackRock, former hedge fund, now bank, because they invest in uh, gun uh, manufacturers. So GAG is asking BlackRock to divest that ownership. 10% of Storm Ruger they own and 6.4% of Smith & Wesson. And there will be an action on Monday. If you are in New York and want to participate, go to Paley Park on East 53rd Street between 5th and Madison at noon. Gays Against Guns, noon, Monday, East 53rd between 5th and Madison. Okay. All right. International news. Yes. Good news from Belize, where the Supreme Court there has just overturned the ban on sodomy. This case was brought by a very brave activist named uh, Caleb Orozco. Uh, the law was rarely used, but it carried a 10-year penalty. He, the case has been going on for three years, so, so that's one down 
and 77 sodomy laws to go. <laughs> Caleb was a, is a great activist and was featured in a big uh, photo spread and story in the New York Times Magazine. Very brave. Uh, the judge had delayed, the case was heard three years ago, the judge delayed the ruling but now has finally done it. In Turkey, a gay Syrian refugee was found beheaded in Istanbul. He had previously, months before, been kidnapped and raped. Muhammad, we have a of him. Muhammad Wissam Sankari, uh, known to his friends as Wissam. Uh, horrible, horrible story. So violent what they did to him. There and, he is. and, you know, this is considered a refuge for gay refugees to go to Istanbul. And yet, this is the kind of violence that happens. Mutilated, uh, beaten and raped five months ago. The UN is doing nothing. Uh, they, uh, the UN police are doing nothing. It's a terrible situation. Mm -hmm. Uh, and good news from Serbia, where the prime minister is nominating a an out lesbian as the minister of state administration and local self government. Serbia. Anna, Anna Bernarbić uh, is considered an up and coming politician, and congratulations to her. On the other hand, uh, Indonesia is considering making gay sex a crime uh, after a review of petitions from Islamic activists. This is, again, brought by the religious right. It's not technically a, a crime there, uh, but uh, they want to make it one. And a lot happening in Uganda oh. this week. They were attempting to do a week of pride festivities. So the first thing that happened was that uh, uh, the local LGBT community was holding an event at a local nightclub. Mr. and Miss Pride Uganda pageant. Uh, the police busted in, arrested more than 20 people, including our pal Frank Mugisha from Smug, Sexual and Minorities Uganda. And beat people, mostly trans women. Yes, they, uh, hundreds of people. They, there were several hundred people in the nightclub. 200. They sexually assaulted uh, uh, particularly trans women uh, and, as you say, beat them. One jumped from an upper window and is still in dire condition, may or may not survive. And then the government said that it will continue to suppress the public activities of homosexuals and that, uh, and that a rehabilitation program has been developed to help us lead normal lives. And in the midst of this, the Pride Parade, which they have held in the past, was canceled after a cabinet minister threatened to bring cops and a mob to beat up people. And the U.S. ambassador there uh, to Uganda is uh, heartily objecting to all this. Yeah. In uh, Tanzania, they're going to suspend the registration of charities and organizations supporting the LGBTQ community. The justice, justice minister, in quotes, says the ban will help protect the nation's culture. In Bogota, Colombia, uh, the first uh, gay men married under the new legalization have been getting death threats. In India, the government is, in, is introducing a transgender rights bill and will punish those who exploit and harass transgender people, giving hope to the community that has faced a lot of discrimination. Yeah, but this in a country where they still haven't overturned the sodomy ban yes, that, would you do that was reinstituted. Right after the court had overturned it. In Ireland, the Archbishop of Dublin has fired uh, trainee priests who are <laughs> using Grinder to meet men. And in Belfast, the uh, Pride Parade there in its 26th year, 26th year was headed by Belfast's first openly gay deputy mayor, Sinn Féin's Mary Ellen Campbell. In the country of Georgia, the president is not giving his permission, which he had to give, for an anti-marriage referendum uh, to amend the Constitution to ban same-sex marriage. That's good. Well, he said, uh, we don't have to do that. It's already in the law. It's already illegal to do same-sex marriage. That, that never stopped governors in American states. Well, in fact, the right wing is appealing his uh, denial of permission, so the story is not over. In uh, Jamaica, the U.S. ambassador there, Luis Moreno, wanted to show his support for LGBT Jamaicans, so let's show you his picture. He Looks wore, just like you. He wore a rainbow <laughs> tie and lit up the embassy in rainbow colors. He's a career foreign service officer, much decorated for his service around the world. I should have made you wear your rainbow tie today so you could compare it but to But a his. little more trouble for the ambassador to the Philippines.
uh, President Duterte there uh, said he referred to the American ambassador there as a homosexual and a son of a bitch who really annoys me. Um, he said, uh, Kerry's not so bad, but this guy really annoys me. Uh, there's no indication that, that Philip Goldberg, the ambassador, is homosexual. Uh, but, uh, you know, this guy is out of control. Well, let's go to the Olympics okay. and the LGB. Uh, the you may remember when last we visited the Olympics two years ago, the Winter Olympics in Sochi, Russia, the whole fight was over whether uh, LGBT people would be welcome, could be out, would be arrested. No Pride House in Sochi. No. Uh, Brazil is a different story, uh, uh, pretty much. Uh, in the opening ceremonies, uh, a trans uh, model, who's a well-known international model, Leia T., uh, marched uh, in the opening ceremonies. Uh, some of the five of the country placards in the parade of athletes were carried by trans people. Uh, as, as the torch was coming into the, the stadium, uh, somewhere along its route, two male uh, torch bearers kissed. I think we have a picture of that. The male, there, yeah, they, there are, they are, kissing along the way. Um, uh, let's see what else here. Uh, well, uh, we also, uh, well, let's see. Uh, we have the uh, rugby players. Uh, the Brazilian rugby player, we have a picture. Uh, Isadora Cerullo and her partner, Marjorie Enya, got engaged on Monday night following the rugby final between Australia and New Zealand. I like all the excitement behind them of everybody with the balloons and everything. The woman in the green jacket is the rugby player and her partner, fiance, is a volunteer at the games in the yellow and orange. Uh, the rugby team from Brazil did not finish high up, but uh, Everybody's very excited about and then the, the engagement. Uh, there was a married, I believe this is football, married couple Helen and Kate Richardson Walsh helped team Great Britain to get one step closer to the gold medal. Uh, yeah, the field hockey players? Yeah, yes. Were they field hockey? I'm yes. sorry, field hockey, not uh, football. Uh, they, this is the fourth games they have competed in. Uh, now, in basketball, there, one of the WNBA stars, in fact, she was the MVP of the WNBA, uh, Elena Deladone, uh, and plays on the U.S. Uh, Olympic team, uh, was interviewed in, and profiled in Vogue magazine, where she talked very matter-of-factly about her fiancé, Amanda Clifton. We have a picture there. They are together. Guess what? The basketball player is the tall one on the right. But there wasn't, NBC didn't seem to give a respect to uh, Tom Daly and his partner, so we have a picture of them. Tom Daly is the British uh, uh, synch diver. Uh, synchro diver, and he won the gold medal with his partner, Bronze. Daniel. Da Bronze. I'm sorry, Daniel Goodfellow is his uh, swim, uh, diving partner. But uh, NBC did not refer to Dustin Lance Black, the Academy Award winning screenwriter who was in the audience the whole time, uh, which I think is a uh, 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 bad. We have to go back to NBC with more demonstrations. We have to interrupt the Today Show again. Uh, we've done it before. Oh, and uh, we were not they're about happy. to get. They're going to get married, by the way. And in uh, early uh, games with the U.S. women's soccer team, the Brazilian fans were yelling homophobic slurs from the stands, which and, was and, uh, whether or not knowing that there are uh, openly gay players on the teams as well and coaches, as well. So that's not good. No. Not well. Good. Uh, what else? Uh, uh, Nike, there is a, there is a trans, yes, there is a trans male triathlete from the U.S. competing uh, at the games, Chris Mosier, and he is featured in a new Nike TV ad. Yeah, it's a nice ad. Well, it's nice except that it refers to him as a trans athlete competing against men, not competing against other men like himself but competing against men. And it, uh, some objections have been raised by trans activists about the wording in the Nike ad, which is a little dicey. But certainly we were happy to see him in that. OK. And so that's all we know about the Olympics at the moment. Yeah, uh, some uh, American sports uh, items. The uh, Chicago Fire uh, Major League Soccer team, the general manager, the, 
partner there, Nelson Rodriguez, at the team's Pride Night. He went out on the pitch, out, out on you know, out on the field, and announced the decision that if you're caught uh, ch uh, chanting "puto" or any other anti-gay slur, you will be removed from the stadium. Uh, and he said, don't let the door hit you in the butt. Most pl applauded, but there were some boos, and it was a small minority. And so, the, so there is an effort in football across the world to try to stand up to this kind of stuff, because it's a typical thing that fans do. Uh, Trump should try it at his rallies. <laughs> no, McCain did it, and, uh, and he lost the election. So Trump will not be condemning his uh, racist, homophobic fans. Okay. They must have given him some sort of a drug. He didn't object to all the, he didn't say anything about all the people interrupting his economic speech. Oh, please. You don't think they drilled him for days on <laughs> what that? What good does that do? Well, in this case, when you're talking to the Detroit Economic Club, you want to uh, look a little more, uh, he was trying, look, he was reading the whole speech. He was trying to look presidential to the extent he can. I, you could see just the pain on his face yeah, of see, not going it, it after the It made him very nervous. Protesters. He even talked about the titties in, in, in Michigan and what he meant to say cities. <laughs> I missed that. You missed that one? Yeah. Uh, that was a big one. Okay. That's what happens when you read and you don't proofread. Okay. All right. Um, well, uh, there's a big movement now by Athlete Ally and NCLR and some others to try to stop the NCAA from letting BYU, Brigham Young University, join the Big 12 Conference because of their anti-LGBTQ discrimination. They have rules at Brigham Young University of no gay sex, no gay contact. Uh, probably no premarital sex Correct. for straight students, too. But they're very, very, very anti-gay. And the NCAA has now very pro-gay rules and is now requiring cities that want to hold NCAA tournaments and stuff to prove that they don't discriminate. So the Big 12, which only has 10 schools at the moment because schools shift around, uh, is looking to bring in BYU as one of their schools, and, and now this opposition has arisen. We'll see whether they pay attention to it. All right. Uh, all right, AIDS news. Uh, I, the British High Court has ruled that the National Health Service must cover PrEP, pre-exposure prophylaxis, Truvada, whatever. Uh, and that's a turnaround because the National Health Service had really been resistant to that. Uh, and in fact, they're going to appeal this decision. Uh, well, what they said was you can, you, you, you know, you're not barred from covering it because that was their argument. We're not allowed to do this. Mm -hmm. And they're saying, yes, no, yes, you are. So the health service is actually putting away the funds because they think they're going to lose and yeah. they know they're going to have to pay for it. And there's an international consensus statement that has been put out by a lot of uh, public health officials around the world saying that there is a negligible risk of transmission of HIV from someone who has undetectable suppressed virus. And the first U.S. public health official to sign on to this statement is our own Dr. Dimitri Deskalakis here in New York City. Right. We need to bring him back. Yes, we should. Yeah. All right. Uh, entertainment news. Should we start with your cats review? Uh, it's, it's going to take too long. <laughs> All I really want to say about cats is that cats is Cats. Uh, it ran for 18 years starting in 1982. You know, when it opened, it was like this, oh, book by T.S. Eliot, the great, <laughs> yes. uh, which it, it, he wrote these cat poems. That's what is, he won the Tony Award. He was long dead, <laughs> but he won the Tony Award for it. His uh, uh, wife picked it up. Is he an uh, EGOT so yet? It, so it had kind of a, it had kind of a, no, it had kind of a, um, you know, an air of uh, sophistication about it. Mm. Well, look, it's got, it's got some good tunes. I mean, I think people are right that uh, Memories. You, you are going to miss Betty Buckley <laughs> when you hear uh, Leona, Leona Lewis. Lewis. Yeah, who's 31. She's she, a great singer. She's got the pipes, but she can't act, and so that's a little bit of a problem, but uh, it's Cats. If you've never seen it, I, I went with my friend Jim, who'd never seen it, he had a great time. Why is it that the people we take to the theater enjoy it more than we do? <laughs> Except I don't when you take me. Uh, are you going to see Alice in black and white? 
I don't know what that is. That's the uh, play about Alice Austin, oh, uh, the right. out lesbian uh, famous photographer who lived on Staten you Island go? with her lover Gertrude Tate. Maybe it's at 59 East 59. All right. Those theaters. I'll give them a uh, call. Through August 14th, we better get there quick. But okay. you better get there quick. Uh, Alice in Black and White's gotten very good reviews. Good. Uh, also, I told you very briefly uh, a week or two ago, because I only had a couple of seconds about this movie, Women He's Undressed, a documentary uh, playing in L.A., I think, but now out on DVD and uh, video on demand. It's about Ori Kelly, the famous oh, yes. uh, Hollywood uh, uh, costume designer. Lover of Cary Grant. Yes, and it's a, a lot of it is about how they lived together in New York when they were both very young and up and coming and how Ori Kelly went on to be an out gay man in Hollywood and ended up very contemptuous of Cary Grant, who refused to be out in Hollywood. Well, who was out Who was out among the big stars then? Well, you had George Cukor. Besides Cukor Franklin and... Pangborn. <laughs> well, they weren't out, out, out. I yeah. mean, everybody knew they were gay. I'm just saying, they went their separate they, ways. They did. And, it's, uh, and this movie is an interesting combination of both sort of recreations of them and, uh, and people portraying them and interviews with actual stars who knew all these people. Jane Fonda is interviewed extensively, Angela Lansbury, others. And they talk about uh, Cary Grant and his relationship with Randolph Scott and how that was sort of, you know, hiding in plain sight. Yes. Uh, so Women He's Undressed is actually quite an interesting movie. And yet when Chevy Chase called Cary uh, uh, gay on the Johnny Carson show, uh, Cary Grant sued him. And I think won. <laughs> Well, Liberace sued, too, for being called gay. All and we do is report. We just report it. Because there's nothing wrong with it. Uh, there isn't. I want to uh, mourn the death of Elliot Tiber at, at 81. He was the young gay guy who... Uh, uh, gave a home to the Woodstock Festival. Oh, right, and he wrote a great book about it. Yes, he did. He also was at Stonewall. Wow. <laughs> so Elliot Tiber, uh, actually uh, present at history, uh, dead at 81. Uh, they, they had been turned down elsewhere for the festival, and he said, well, I, I'm 31, but I'm the mayor of this town, and uh, I've got a permit, so I'm giving you the permit, and, uh, and you can uh, stage the festival here. There's a, uh, there's a movie about it. Yes, there is. Uh, Taking Woodstock. Hit, by Ang Lee. Right. Uh, also, we got a note from a viewer about a. I'm sorry. Was he the mayor or is the guy who owned the motel? Uh, the, he the was. Land? He was. Well, I'll reread the all obit. Right. But okay. here, you read the no, obit. All right, you go ahead. Uh, <laughs> uh, Grand Theft Auto, an extremely violent video game, has created a section called uh, Pride Parade. Uh, as a tribute to Orlando and the massacre there. It's very strange. People are debating whether that's appropriate for Grand Theft Auto, but nonetheless, it's there, and you can take a look if you want. And we will see you next week. We are done. Elliot owned the motel. Thank you. <laughs> but he was also the, some public official. Okay. Uh, we'll continue to debate this. See you in a week. Bye. Bye-bye.